welcome to another episode of the Being Human and Doing Psychotherapy podcast, uh, where I try to investigate what is the human part of every psychotherapist and what is the psychotherapeutic part that we are carrying in all of us humans. Uh, and today I'm joined by Leah Mahoney, uh, a person that I have met only recently, but his gentle presence has invited me to invite him to this podcast. And I have just found out that he is uh, interested in developmental trauma and use of touch in developmental trauma, which is one of my interests. So I'm very curious to explore this today. So welcome, Liam. <laughs> Thank you. So the first question I always ask is, what are some words that you describe yourself with or you identify with or which are the identities that you see yourself through? I think um, certainly gentleness mm. gentleness for sure and patient and i think presence certainly kindness but then at the same time and not, not so much on the other kind of polarity but there's it's one one of the words that kind of really for the last few years I've been working to integrate more is is rage. Mm. Re, so so that that's very much there as well. Um. Yeah, I think they they would cover it. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, uh, how are you patient with your rage? Well, how am I patient with my rage? Um. I think I'm I'm much I I I think today I have much more of a relationship mm -hmm. with my rage. And I think I definitely have a much more kind of patient relationship with my rage. And I'm much more receptive mm -hmm. to my rage. I I I very much own it more. Mm -hmm that it's mine and it doesn't belong to anybody else so so I'm I think my pay as well the patience is that I have a lot of kind of curiosity towards it mm -hmm. I'm, I'm able to probably show up more to kind of welcome it and and certainly not to kind of act it in or to kind of act it out as much for sure and I'm curious, when it comes to rage, uh, what do you think are the messages that your rage often brings to you? And what do you think are the messages be behind our anger and rage? And how can we listen to them with curiosity, as you mentioned? I think it's, I, I think often, no, I think the messages for sure are very kind of individual. Mm -hmm. I think it's I think it's a great question because I, I I see it as I see it as very as a kind of a really kind of important step of integrating rage. Like I think the first for me what has been very helpful in beginning to integrate more and more of my rage is firstly to own it that it's mine, mm -hmm. and I think then the second part is very much around your question, Alexandra, about what's my rage trying to communicate to me mm. and what's my rage trying to communicate to um the environment and i think i think some of the the mess i think the big message in rage for me seems to be around not being met mm -hmm. and and having a kind of a real expectation of being met and then not being met in a very kind of profound way is um I think what certainly a big kind of message in in my rage mm -hmm. and I'm curious uh the rage of not being met uh, is that something that has dissipated as you have slowly being more and more met by yourself and other people or is something that still comes with the same intensity no i think i think certainly 
I think certainly the more I kind of integrate the rage and and certainly kind of ironically, the more I kind of meet it mm-hmm. and with, without judgment. And I think when I have a kind of healing experiences as well of, of people being able to, to meet my rage. And I, I think more when I kind of feel more kind of present around it and that it feels more contained. One of the things that starts to happen, I think it, for me is starting to happen. I, I kind of, it, it kind of brings, because it's it's a kind of a powerful energy. Mm-hmm. It, bring, it brings me, it actually brings me more in contact with my aliveness Mm-hmm. and my my vitality really mm-hmm. so it, mm-hmm. so it you know something that I would have seen very kind of as very bad or kind of a part of me that was very bad is actually you know yeah there's really in the rage kind of lives you know this be my experience has lived my vitality and my um my aliveness Mm, that's interesting there is um, a person i'm just listening to recently uh, listening to marshall rosenberg and he talks about listening to what is alive in people behind the words and the emotions and everything they are expressing and and that's very beautiful that you you have just said that now oh, thank um, you. Uh, i'm curious um rage is something that's often connected to masculinity um and one of the questions I ask here is how do you feel in your gender um, and what do you think has been societally where your gender was stopping you from getting into in contact with some of different facets of, of the human existence? Um, sorry, could you, could you say, I, I'm not sure I kind of understand it fully. So what do you think? So First is how do you feel in your gender and how has that shaped how you express rage and other facets and other emotions um, outwardly? Okay. Well, I, I, if I ca- captured it right, I, I feel very comfortable being a man. Um, and I think it, it, it probably has kind of helped that... Um, the emotion of anger or rage is probably most kind of associated with men, even though you know women have have anger and rage as well. So it, it I think, you know, I, I suppose I, I I I've never understood. I I probably never understood um, emotions much, and um, I would have like. I think, you know, where I grew up, um, it was okay for men to be angry. Mm. And it was cook, it was okay for men to to have rage. Um so I I I I had no kind of probably problem with anger or rage. So it was that was in in some ways that was an easier emotion for me then say a kind of sadness or kind of grief um so yeah i think does that answer the question Mm -hmm. and i'm also curious when did you then get in touch with the sadness and the grief and what what facilitated that for you i i think um I think what what facilitates getting in touch with the anger and grief is that if I, number one, if I don't have an agenda around getting in touch with it, and that if I, if I have more of um, a kind of a stance towards myself where, where I kind of can kind of just meet what I what I experience. So if I if I'm if, you know if I if I if I have only thoughts, then I can meet the thoughts. If I have only emotions, then I can meet the emotions. So I think the big the big the big support is that you 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 don't put and with this is cha- this is the challenging part because of my history. Um, 
one of the ways that I um I survived what I survived is that I would put a lot of pressure on myself mm-hmm. to be a certain way and you know even things like um you know that we should be more embodied that we should be more in the moment so I think I think when I kind of was able to kind of meet the pressure mm-hmm. without kind of identifying with the pressure and then I think when I when I got more of a receptivity of meeting all myself and just being curious about you know what's in the way of meeting whatever I whatever I need to meet I, th- I think that's the secret mm-hmm. I think the secret is um becoming more present to myself with with lots of curiosity and and little agenda mm. it sounds it sounds easy but I know it's sometimes an insurmountable task <laughs> well for sure it's not easy <laughs> yeah it's simple but not easy yeah <laughs> uh, I'm curious uh, you have said survive what I uh, what I survived and I'm I'm curious what of that uh, are you willing to share with us that shaped you to be who you are today? Okay, well, I was I was born in 1970, mm-hmm. and I I don't know how familiar you are, Alexandra, with with our Irish history. A but... little bit. Uh, I I feel like it's very similar to where I come from, full of tensions and separated territories, <laughs> uh, and a lot of struggles. And that's that's as far as I will go. <laughs> yeah. So absolutely. So one of one of the things that um, was a huge kind of feature of Irish Irish history was um, industrial schools mother and baby homes so I, I think at I think at one time the government of Ireland used to boast that we didn't have many people in prisons oh wow mm-hmm. but the problem was that we didn't because they were all kind of we were they were all we were all locked up in industrial schools or mother and baby homes or you know there was this kind of I suppose culture of in, institution institutionalizing people. Um, mm-hmm. So my my part of my history is that I was born in a mother and baby home, and mm-hmm. that was nineteen seventy. And can you to, say more about that? Uh, because I am not familiar with with that term uh, of yeah. modern baby home. So because because in Ireland the Catholic Church were hugely dominant. Mm-hmm. Like if a if a if a woman had a child out of wedlock, mm-hmm. it was looked at on as a big sin, mm-hmm. you know that you know real kind of shameful thing. So what would happen that because if the the woman wasn't married, they'd be sent off to these mother and babies homes. Mm-hmm. And now what's after coming out in hindsight is that these were probably the most toxic places on earth really Mm -hmm. and you for the most part what would happen in there is that the the mother would go in there you know before she'd have the baby she'd the the baby be born and the baby would be put up for adoption then so these places were run like you know probably not not kind of far-fetched to say they were probably run like concentration camps Mm -hmm. You know, so they were really kind of, as I say, toxic places. So this was this was this was the start of of my life. Um, and again, in hindsight, I know today from doing lots of development and you know lots of other stuff is that my my biological mother was um, a real you know she was a very distressed woman, mm-hmm. kind of a lot of kind of trauma in her history. So there's a her her mother, my grandmother, would have um would have been born in not sorry, not born, but I would have spent a lot of time in a mental asylum. Mm-hmm. So there's a there's a you know a lot of kind of what you might call transgenerational trauma mm-hmm. coming down the line. So again, how one so 
as as we said at the start, I know fundamentally from my own experiences that that what that environment that I was born into and and my biological mother couldn't couldn't meet me in the way that I needed to be met. And so when this happens, you know, you what we know that we need to kind of survive then. And I think some of the ways that some of the ways that I survived is number one, and it's kind of it's it's a strange thing to think about to survive this way, but it's actually a very creative adaptation. But one of the things I started doing is that I started hating myself. And and the creativity about hating yourself is that if you start hating yourself, what what's authentic in me doesn't come forward. So what's what's authentic in me, my authentic needs and my authentic emotions become kind of shut down. So so that that was the start of my survival process, really, that, you know, I I had these parts of my personality that took over the function of hating myself Mm -hmm. and through hating myself, then what was authentic never came forward. Mm-hmm. And where did that lead you? In which are which were the alleys that where that hate towards yourself was actually externalized? Yeah, um, in very in very kind of um, I suppose in very kind of different kind of arenas, really. Um, but the other funny thing about it is, you know, growing up. Um, I wouldn't have been able to kind of verbalize that. I wouldn't even have been aware of that. Mm-hmm. So it's like, because I kind of, the other way I survived is I shut all that down. Mm-hmm. But even though you shut that down, it still comes true. Um, so I think how how it got expressed was um, certainly true, um, true kind of lack of self-esteem. Mm-hmm. You know, just not having really kind of, really kind of doubting, doubting my competence and doubting my kind of lovability. Mm. So it it really got in, in and of course in, in relationships is, is where it really showed up, mm. you know, not not being able to show up in a in, a, in an authentic way in relationships. And and not really ha- being able to have relationships, being able to have um, kind of superficial relationships for sure. Um, but but I haven't been able to have kind of close intimate relationships. Um, so so isolation isolation was was certainly kind of an expression of it, uh, Alexandra. Um, you know, could be with lots of people, but never never felt any connection to them. Um, I think another way where it showed up for sure is that um, didn't feel, now again, this is kind of language I use now, but at the time I wouldn't have been able to verbalize it, but I didn't feel connected to myself. So I, it's like, it's like I think one of the things I took from my early experiences is that emotions are, are dangerous. Mm-hmm. you know especially the emotions of kind of rage and and grief so I kind of disconnected from my emotions um so I think the expre- expression of that is that I, I was I live very much in my mind mm-hmm. and when you when when I lived in my mind like that um it kind of led to a paranoia mm-hmm. kind of led to a kind of distrust of people um really kind of felt that you know I do I needed to stay clear of people because people would take advantage of me mm-hmm. that if I really kind of so so I, I think the in, the expression of it is that there was a lot of my energy was tied up in kind of staying invisible mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and a lot of my energy was yeah was was tied up in um 
you know, keeping people at a distance. Mm. So I think I think they would be have been the expression, so many expressions of it. And what do you think initiated you in starting to look at that? Uh, and then being able to actually see, oh, wow, what is it that I'm doing this here? And how can I meet myself? Yeah, I think, um, well, I think, did, I think one of the things that happened to me is that um, I, 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 I developed a, a dependency on alcohol. Mm-hmm. So one of the ways that... Um, I suppose I managed, you know, with with that level of shutdown and that level of self hatred, was that I I started drinking, and drinking, of course, like as we know, alcohol was very helpful to me because it it, it helped me to, in some way, have some level of contact with people, and it, you know, it, drinking was kind of um was a real kind of escape for me for you know for how I felt but as you know with most kind of dependencies it it developed and it started getting very kind of problematic Mm -hmm. and I I had which which sometimes doesn't happen in addiction I had some kind of capacity for kind of reflective capacity Mm -hmm. so after a few years I didn't even though I even though I knew alcohol was helpful, I didn't, I used to get very kind of scared of the consequence. Well, certain parts of me would get very scared of the consequences of my drinking and the, the, the kind of inhibition that went with my drinking. So I started wanting to stop drinking. And then, of course, what happened, I, I get a period of time off to drink in but I couldn't no I again I didn't have the language that I have now but I, like most people that have a dependency and stop actually I started getting worse and when I get when I mean I got worse I you know what worse felt like that is that a kind of a generalized anxiety was just chronically anxious even though I wouldn't have had the words for it and I was kind of chronically depressed mm-hmm. and so that would have been the start then I was kind of thinking what's going on here like I've, I've stopped drinking now but here I am I'm actually worse I'm more anxious and I'm more depressed mm. so that's that's that was a kind of a turning point for me really um so you you had that quality of being able to observe that but what was the moment where you were like I can see this but I can't solve it by myself. Um, it took me a long time to um to get to that moment, Alexander. I think because even though I could see, I could see for um, I could see for a long time, a good few years, even after stopping drinking, that you know that I had um, you know, kind of significant maybe what people would call in a very generic sense mental health issues um mm-hmm. but to see with with developmental trauma you <clears throat> you, you you don't you, you want to get well but you don't want to get well in the context of a relationship mm-hmm. that's the big that was the big feature of me and that what I see you now with lots of people that I work with so I wanted to get well, but you see, the, the, the ch- some of the, another challenge that I had, which is a fairly significant challenge, is that I wouldn't tell anybody what was going on inside me. Yeah. Mm. You know, so that was a that was a huge management strategy for me. I I I would I tell you when I'm good, and I I might, and then I came to a stage where I might tell you in hindsight you know, the last few days were bad. But when I was in that place where I was, you know, in in bits and dysregulated and, you know, emotionally in a kind of a bad way, I couldn't reach out to people. Mm. So, so for me, I thought if I did enough mindfulness or if I did enough kind of stuff on my own that I, I, I might be able to recover. 
but I just the thoughts of recovering in the context of a relationship were for a long time were just absolutely overwhelming for me. Mm. Um, and I, and I, you know, so it, it take it took me a, a good few years. It's probably only in the last few years, to be honest, where I kind of realized that you you actually you can't recover from you know de- developmental trauma or probably any trauma really. But certainly from developmental trauma on your own, that it's only through the context of a relationship. And and so for somebody that has, you know, for any of us that have been so kind of wounded in relationships, that's the challenge. Mm. That's, yeah, that's an interesting thing. I, I say that uh, to, to many people. It's that um, uh, a hurt that has originated from a relationship or yeah. a lack of one can't really be <laughs> can't really be addressed without another relationship which will be able to help that and heal that hurt and absolutely it's, it's 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 interesting to me i think it's also seems to be culturally um strengthening this idea that we can do these things on our own and that if we as you said if we just do enough yoga mindfulness gym whatever else uh suddenly we will solve whatever problems we are experiencing but uh, as you are mentioning there are some things that can only be addressed and nurtured within a context of a of a listening other if we're going to use bonnie's word absolutely and i think i think you're dead right alexander i think certainly it's certainly culturally but i think it's also transgenerationally yeah because, because if you t- like for me that kind of that kind of you know don't let anybody know what's going on inside you was so was so kind of deep I often think but but you and I often think then like my my biological grandmother like say in Ireland and I know what it was like in in your homeland but but in Ireland say it in the not as even in the 70s maybe 80s in the back if if you kind of express that you were distressed, there was no real kind of treatment. So you were kind of more likely the chances are that you're going to be locked up mm. for the rest of your life. So it it kind of made sense that you might try to hide that. Yeah. So that was another creative adaptation, Absolutely. basically. Yeah. 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 And and I'm I'm wondering what I always admire, even for people in my home country is when they actually stay there and still manage to find the help and still manage to somehow heal and I feel that's a heroic move um I for example for me it was necessary and I'm reiterating this through many of the podcasts I really needed to move away I think I needed to experience a different culture of different way of being to just see that people can actually be different and treated differently and and that's what kind of helped me to piece by piece bit by bit integrate uh the traumatic experiences so i'm wondering how did you do that with the within the context of of your own country where i'm i'm assuming that there is like a collective narrative about things as you just mentioned that keep it for yourself don't talk it's okay it could be worse we've gone through worse or things like that um yeah i think it's a it's an interesting question um i think it was very much um with me it was very much um a kind of a, a slow process for sure um mm-hmm. and it was very much I, I made lots of mistakes. Well, I don't know what you call them mistakes, but certainly um, it was it, it was challenge. It was challenging for sure because we we still in Ireland, and even in in, in lots of different kind of um, caregiving kind of settings we we really don't understand trauma and we really don't understand how the expression of trauma um, so 
for me, it, 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 it was challenging in the sense that, and, and I think this is a kind of a, cru a crucial point, is that it's, it's a real kind of challenge to reconnect to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because we, when I, when I kind of, and I, I don't want to go too much off your point now, but when I, like most people, when you kind of go into therapy, you, you expect to get better. Mm -hmm. but my experience is that for a lot of time for the, a lot of years I actually got worse and that makes sense that makes sense today because of course what what happens people is that you know certainly for me that because I was so shut down is that when you start coming out of that shutdown response you kind of meet everything that puts you into that shutdown response. Yeah. And that can be fairly kind of significant. Um, so, so I think that the challenge is, is the challenge for me about what you're saying was to try to, tr to be able to kind of trust people um, enough just to kind of, the way I kind of describe it is I often, I'm giving, um, I given a workshop there in October, November, and on I call it developmental trauma, the unseen road to addiction. And it's it's a bit like I think recovery from trauma is a bit like coming out of an eggshell. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's saying that if you break an eggshell from the outside, life ends. And if you break it from the inside, that life begins. And I think, you know, for me it was a bit like coming out of that egg and it's like popping your head out and popping your head back in. And and it was challenging because um, there was a lot of there was a lot of um, stuff happened. So I started meeting a lot of parts of myself that. So especially, I'm fifty you now. At at the time when I was forty, I started meeting a lot of parts of myself that were unconscious up to then, mm -hmm. and really very kind of deep wounded parts of myself and. And at times I would kind of, I would be re find it really hard because I, I, I might be sitting with Juno you know, as a client and next of all, th these parts would get very active. And at the time, I remember kind of, um, it's, not, it's kind of a funny story now, but at the time it wasn't funny. But um, at the time, I don't know if you're familiar with that therapy, it's called Internal Family Systems, yeah. Richard Swartz and... I had done the IFS training and during the training I had started um, to meet parts of myself, as I say, that I wasn't aware, aware of up to that far, far, that was about 40. And to one part of myself that I would meet, it was like, it was like a thought and the thought was, I wish I was dead. Mm -hmm. And like, even though my life had been, I'd faced a lot of challenges, I never had any kind of suicidal ideation. But like I'd be sitting with clients then, Alexandra, and that thought would start coming up. And I didn't, you know, I didn't know what to do with it. You know, should I say this mm -hmm. to clients and, and all this kind of thing. And I remember one particular day I, at, you know, I used to do some work in, um, in a particular center for people with addiction. And I remember saying this to two colleagues that I didn't know that well, but I think it was just a kind of created hearing these kind of parts of me kind of created a vulnerability in me mm -hmm. I remember saying it saying it to these two colleagues and they kind of looked at me like I had two heads mm. they, they had no understanding of it and um and of course they 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 went straight to thinking that it was a kind of a psychiatric hearing voices kind of problem so so if I'm kind of answering your question right now, you could tell me if I did. It it was challenging because it was challenging, certainly in that I found it hard to kind of share any of this with people. Mm -hmm. And number number two, it it was just at the time in Ireland, you know, there wasn't a lot of people that were really um into kind of healing trauma. Yeah. And people kind of did counseling, but they didn't kind of do the, the deeper work. So so challenging for sure. Does that does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. 
And where did you find the resources to support you in those challenges? What do you think was what supported you in that path? Um, I think it's kind of interesting because I don't know, would you look at this as a resource, but like one of the, I think one of the things that happens with early trauma is that we, we form a kind of a belief that that is an, an illusion in a sense. Mm. And that, well, it, it's an absolute illusion that, yes. you know, the belief is that and it goes in many different forms, but the belief is um, there's something fundamentally wrong with me. Which is a kind of a very um, kind of natural, you know, consequence of developmental trauma. So I think what happens then, Alexandra, is that it's like parts of our personality that are so young believe that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what you look at as a resource, but there's always parts of our personality then pushing us to get to get better and to get kind of in some way kind of fixed mm -hmm. so that that where that was going on a long time for me where where parts of my personality would would really kind of push me on when I didn't want to go on anymore mm. so so I that's a kind I don't know would you look at it as a, a resource but certainly um mm. certainly I think that was there I kind of met a lot of good people along the way um met a lot of people in, in 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 trainings and personal development courses i think as well that were kind of a really good resource um yeah i think that they would be the main two yeah that's interesting uh, um if again i'm to use bonnie's words the protector was really protecting you by Although it looks like something that was negative about you, it was still the one that was helping you to find help. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, yeah. and you know, put you know, pushing you on all the time, which was, yeah. which was, and you know, the protectors, I think, are so relentlessly loyal. Yeah, and they really kind of, you know, even even though at times it doesn't feel like it, but they're so. They're so kind of, yeah, I think that's the best word, relentlessly loyal, that they never give up. <laughs> no, they don't. And they never give up on us. Yes, no, that's really true. Uh, and uh, I'm curious, uh, we talked about um, your journey with addiction, and then I really like the title of um, of the workshop that you will be offering, which is the heroic intention of addiction. Mm. And I would like to hear more what's behind that title. And I feel it's somehow tied to what we just discussed. So, uh, so yeah, I, I think there is a lot of, um, there is a lot of strong language used around addiction and obviously a lot of pain tied into it, but it is a support in a sense, in a very weird sense. So I'm curious to hear. Absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, it it. I think the the title is that. No, yeah, because if you think about it, um, if we look at say, usually with people with developmental trauma, number one, I mean, there's never just one addictive path. So there's 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 like a hierarchy of addictive paths. So with my when my in, when my internal system goes into a certain organization or disorganization more likely, then this path will take over. Then if it goes into a deeper disorganization, then a deeper. So I, th I think there's always, um, nearly all the time in, in, in addiction, there's a hierarchy of paths. So I like to look at it as a part of, of my personality. And if you think of culturally, and I don't know what it's like in your country, but in Ireland, Addiction gets bad press as if it's something bad that, you know, and we we have all these kind of myths about addiction, that addiction is a disease and all this kind of stuff. So from the outside world, addiction in the kind of a general sense, now it's beginning to change. 
is seen as bad yeah as a demon yeah. as a demon yeah so and then if you think of the other parts of our personality so there's other parts of our personality then that see the problem that if we can get rid of the addictive part then all will be rosy in the garden but of course we know that this is this is bullshit so so if you think about the parts of our personality then have that have heroically taken on the role of you know trying to bring kind of relief or connection to a kind of system that's absolutely disorganized and disconnected and exhausted, yeah, yeah exhaust so you you have a comment you have the kind of criticism the judgment the shaming sometimes the hatred mm-hmm. coming from the outside from society and you have it coming from the inside from the other parts of the personality I think right if I get rid of you all would be good but these parts are absolutely so addic- so heroic that they don't listen to that mm-hmm. they are absolutely relentlessly loyal that they they are so loyal to us that they they'll keep going to the bitter end and of course people die and this is a kind of a testament that they'll keep going because these paths for personality are usually kind of immature and young developmentally. So they know that at some time that using alcohol was, you know, it was some way helpful, whatever, it's different for everybody. So because it was helpful at some time, they'll just keep going. And no matter what the other parts of the personality say inside, no matter what society says, you know, that they'll, that's their role and they'll they'll just kind of stick so kind of rigidly to it Mm -hmm. so i think that's why they're heroic Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they are they are in a certain level of support until we provide ourselves with different kind of supports and i'm curious what were those different kind of supports that then slowly helped you to kind of recognize thank you for being the support until now and now i can do these things in different ways well i think with me like most people in addiction i think it's useful to think of you know these parts of our personality it's always curious do they kind of promote connection or they Mm -hmm. do they promote disconnection and sometimes it's it's not either or sometimes it's both um So they're both connection strategies and they're both disconnection strategies. So for me, um, for me, it, uh, you know, for a good few years, it was just other kind of addictions. Mm -hmm. You know, I got into, um, got into gambling, Mm -hmm. got into kind of, um, you know, comfort eating for sure. Um, So, so, for me, it was kind of, but but stop, but stopping drinking was, it was the journey out of the beginning to come out of the egg. Mm-hmm. But for a long time, I, I couldn't really take the the, the support of people. I couldn't tolerate that. Um, so it was, it was probably, you know, exercise as well, probably work. Um, so it it took me a it took me a long time to um to being able to kind of use people in a kind of a healthy way for support mm. um, and i did i probably did a lot of education as well and and you know it's never kind of black and white but that that was a support as well but it was also another kind of form of running for myself mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so there, there, it, it's, it's kind of. I think it, for me, it was kind of, um, it was kind of very slow, because I think the biggest support, of course, is that if we can kind of form kind of healthy relationships. But for me, you no, know, it's an ongoing process. But that was a very kind of slow process. Mm-hmm. And I'm also curious. Um... Who were the people that kind of were holding you, and what do you, what did you find the most helpful in this journey 
of slowly reaching out for that support and often even with the best intentions even therapists don't know how to support us and who do you think was there to to kind of hold most of you let's let's say like that um i think the biggest i think the the biggest um i think it was certainly um certainly um a journey in that um i hated i i hated therapy <laughs> wow that's interesting you know i just absolutely hated therapy um no that could have been that could have been kind of that was certainly me my my process you know i own that but it it also was um i think to do with some of the, the, the therapists i met early on in, in when i say early on i talk about years um because I think, you know, I come back to the, I think I come back to the metaphor of the egg. Mm -hmm. And if you think of us kind of, it's like being reborn, reborn back into our aliveness and back into our vitality. And I think a, the biggest problem I see with therapy is that a lot of therapy can be tried, can try to break the egg from the outside. And what I really kind of needed and what I still need is for somebody that could be with me in an absolutely deep way. But it's, it's, it, it, no, I think it's a lot easier now, but it can be challenging to find somebody like that. Cause I found a lot of therapists that wanted to do stuff to me with, you know, in, and very well intentioned. Out of no kind, you know, only the best, you know, out of the best of intentions. But like I remember um I went to somebody for let's say EMDR. And I would do I would do EMDR and I would I would be like somebody in an electric chair. There was so much kind of shaking. And of course, looking back in hindsight, I know no, my nerve system couldn't tolerate that, you know, because of my developmental history. But I'd be in the chair and I'd be I'd be shaking like this and I'd be thinking in my head, is this good for me? But you don't you see, I don't know. And um so I think I think I think somebody that can be with us in a very kind of deep way is 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 the you know, I think Bonnie talks about it, is the kind of fundamental kind of resource. And somebody that can that can whatever interventions they, they use can support that process of coming out from the egg. But that, and you see, we, one of the things that, can, I, I know one of the things that happened to me is that um, my parts know, even though some felt there was something wrong with me, or the parts know that there's actually nothing wrong with us. So when people start doing stuff to us, then in I get a reaction to that when people would want me to do kind of breathing practices and you know so I, I I think we need somebody that can be with us in a very deep way that can lead that can allow that kind of organic unfolding to happen because I think I think it's Bonnie says it that we have a kind of an inherent treatment plan plan yes I love and, that and that if we if we kind of have the right support, you know, that it, it can happen at our own kind of pace. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And I, I am curious there um, about uh, often we think and sometimes we see breakthroughs in therapy and it's something it seems that as a culture we are supporting and chasing for and you are describing your emdr session and and i can totally imagine that people would be like yeah great amazing something big is happening for you whereas uh for people who have experienced developmental trauma which the soothing of the nervous system is actually what is often more needed than even higher aggravation um 
I am curious about your view on success in therapy and what is successful therapy process and how can we as ther therapists detach from the fact that it's not on us to bring that success and it might be that we are just a part of that journey and that journey will unfold for 20, 50 years and we might not even see the end product. Yeah, for sure. I think I think certainly with um, a lot of the, the therapies, I think you're, you're, you're spot on that. I think the challenge, especially when you work with developmental trauma, which you're nearly working with all the time, is that it's so easy to bring people into expansive states and kind of states of um, aliveness and vitality. Like, you you know, at the at the end of a lot of, in the early years, if I was doing EMDR, I might be doing something else. At the end of the session, because of all this work, with, I, would, I would feel a lot better. Mm -hmm. But of course, I was my nervous system couldn't integrate that. Mm -hmm. So I would, you know, I'd only stay better for a short period of time. Um, so I think, I think for me, for me, I'm kind of working, especially with developmental trauma, it's, um, I think it, number one, what we don't kind of pay enough kind of attention to Alexandra is that, um, we don't pay enough attention to kind of for clients or, you know, or people to find out really kind of what's important for them mm -hmm. and what their kind of intention is in, in our time together and, you know, what the optimal outcome. So I think we, we, we probably need to spend a lot more time doing that. And then, then we have a kind of a reference point. And I think most you know, with, with working with early trauma, I think more, you know, what it seems to me is certainly getting more contact with the emotional life and that was shut down and getting more in contact, obviously, with the aliveness and the vitality, but it, but in a way that that's very kind of gentle mm. that we don't have to, we don't have to kind of force it in any way that's a kind of an organic process and you know through our kind of presence through our kind of curiosity and through our own kind of self-inquiry I think it it happens and I think being kind of genuine ourselves around our own kind of um counter transference reactions is, is probably the most helpful um that you can actually be to people Mm -hmm. and i'm also curious about um the touch part uh, which we haven't touched upon <laughs> uh which is how do you integrate that and um how did you get curious about touch and therapy well how i got curious was that um i was doing a training um in somatic experience in mm -hmm. and by the last module it's, the, it's over it's a three-year training and the last module is um specifically around touch mm -hmm. so how we got curious is interesting so the first day in the last module we were doing very very kind of light kind of touch with each other or the participants on the course so we we might just let's say we just were holding hands and when I put my hand, my left hand in particular, into, say, my my fellow participant's hand, my whole left hand went into this, what I'd only describe as a tremble. Mm. Or, and I was kind of, of course, talk about inhibition in my mind. Oh, my God, you know, I started hating myself. Then, oh, you can't even touch someone, you know, the usual. So by the end of that module, I was bored terrified of the notion of touch and kind of fascinated by the, the notion of touch so at the time this was maybe 2017 um in Ireland there was no specific um touch trainings in Ireland but I you know in the somatic experiencing community there was two people that were um they were highly regarded in America. So one was Cathy Kane and the other was Stephen Terrell. 
So I decided to go to America for a few years to train, which was challenging as well, because one of the places that my trauma would show up was flying. So I would, I would get uh, I would get really kind of I would get full of kind of dread in these kind of long haul flights. But, you know, there was, as well as the dread, I, you know, I had the courage as well. Um, so I went over there all of 2018 and all of 2019 and started training up and specifically doing kind of personal work around touch then. Um, and I think touch has been, touch is, is absolutely so helpful, but you, you, it's like what we've been speaking about. You have to be, you have to be so careful then as well, mm-hmm. because you're, you're, like I think what what we're kind of talking about when you think about it, like even though, pe- or or people that come to us and us, even though they tell us they want to change, but they the other side of it is that they're deeply invested in not changing. Not changing. Yeah. You know what I mean? So if we if we forget about that and and touch. Touch is a fantastic intervention, but you have to be so careful because you don't want to you don't want to work against the protection system. So I'd always say that that that's the big you see, because you're 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 doing to somebody again. Yeah. So you 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 have to be you have to be really careful. But it's 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 a fantastic intervention in that I think the way I look at it is very simple in that, you know. Whoever's, whoever's kind of providing the touch, all we need to be is a few steps ahead of whoever we're treating. Mm-hmm. And it, it's a bit it's a bit unconsciously like saying nervous system to nervous system. My nervous system is staying to your nervous system. I know that you've organized the best way you could. But I also know that you know that there's a different way. Yeah. So true it's like what bonnie talks about you know if if i was if i was working with you now like your healing system and my healing system becomes a single healing system so it and we through through the process of touch when i usually when i touch people for the first time and people have trauma you know you really feel it in your own system you feel the shut down you feel the you know the kind of high hyper aroused states and over time then period of time you kind of feel people being able to come into a more a process of what you might call kind of co-regulation and usually by the end of um by the end of treatment um you know it's very kind of pleasurable to be with people in, in that kind of silent way um so it, it, it's a fantastic intervention, but again, like anything that we do to people has to come with a kind of a caution. Yeah, yeah. So in the interest of time, uh, I just want to ask you, is there anything that you want to add that I haven't asked you? And I think I, I wish there was like another two hours to, to continue this, but is there anything that you would like to add uh, that you think we haven't touched upon? No, I, I think we've co- I think we've covered um, I think we've covered a lot, really. Um, I think the main thing that I think we've covered that is you know kind of being with people in a very deep way is much more kind of important than anything you'll actually do to them. Mm-hmm. So you might say our, our our presence is much more important than our competence, um, and I think if that was the kind of a message, you know, because you know, when we start doing pe- when we start doing to people, unconsciously we might kind of we might be supporting them to kind of run away from themselves, mm. and that the these kind of states of you know dysregulation that you know he used that in a very broad term that people are meeting. There's huge information in in these states, and I know at times like people get so kind of distressed that you have to kind of provide some tools to them but as a general rule you know i'd 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 kind of think we we need to be with people people in a much more deeper way than actually doing anything to them Mm. 
And to finish off, I have a few rapid fire questions. And one of them is, what's an absurd thing about you that not many people know about? <laughs> um, I'm, well, I don't know if this is absurd, but I, 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 I love... I love the 80s love songs. <laughs> What's that? So in the 80s, you, you're probably too young to remember, but uh -huh. it used to be a lot of what they call love kind of songs. Okay. Um, so I, I, I really kind of like that music. <laughs> 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 and um, uh, what do you like to gift people the most? Um, I, like, I, think, I think my presence. Hmm. that's beautiful yeah and uh, what do you think has become more and what has become less important for you as you have gotten older um i think what has become more important certainly is kind of relationships and i think what's become less important is kind of isolation hmm. And um, do you have a question for me? <laughs> um, no, no. <laughs> uh, so I really want to thank you actually for your presence. I feel like uh, I have been co-regulating with you and your voice and your calmness was really, really soothing. So thank you for this. And thanks for all the work you're doing for us. Oh, listen, thank you. And it was great, great to see you. And it was great to, I hope, I hope what you're doing goes well. <laughs>